Have I been brainwashed into religion? Welcome to this week's Q&A uh, in relation to material with the cults. And this is people with a free gift who are ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach those caught in religion. If you're new to the channel, click that subscribe button so you don't miss any future content related to cults and how to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And so let's go ahead and jump right in. Before we do, I want to give a shout out to our new subscriber, Shaft 3 And I also just want to say that the reason why it's been a, a little while since I've uploaded a new video to this channel is because it has been incredibly crazy. We had VBS at my church this last week, and we also were starting Awana very, very soon. And so if you're in the Roundup Montana area, you know, come and check us out out in Emmanuel Baptist Church, but I've just had a ton, ton of stuff that had been going on. So I apologize for not getting the regular content that you're used to out there, but hopefully this next week that'll change and so we can get back to our former thing. So some of the and subscriber count and all that kind of stuff is a little bit outdated because um, I, I, I need, I have a whole slew of notifications and questions and comments and everything else that's waiting for me for next time's Q&A and I might have to do like maybe a couple of different videos once I get caught up. And so with all that do, said, um, I, I, a friend on Google, uh, Google Groups or whatever that, Google Plus, there we go. Um, and I, I see, use the friend, word friend loosely anyway, but he uh, has ha had this ongoing conversation. We have had this back and forth where he doesn't like the fact that I'm not answering him in text on the forum. And uh, he keeps on throwing these, these little like ad hominem jabs at me and my character. So here's the latest one. You don't have to time for reason or reality is what you mean. Because I told him, you know, I don't have time to just keep on going to text. I do the weekly q and I've answered you over there. And, you know, go check it out. And he says, I don't, I don't have time for reason or reality. And he gave this meme that says, you are brainwashed to a religion if there's no proof of your religion being true and you still believe. Well, that's really in a perception because from my perception, I don't really understand how somebody can not see biblical prophecy as just one example and not understand that Jesus is the Messiah and that because he's the Messiah, that means that God's word is true and that everything that Jesus offered us, that he did die for, on our, for our sins on the cross, he rose from the dead. I believe there's, there's evidence for all of those things I just said. And so I, I really don't understand when people come from the standpoint of thinking that there's no proof that's out there to establish Christianity because uh, to me there's just mountains and mountains and mountains of proof um, that my my faith rests upon and evidence and so um, number one not true number two you sh you're shown the proof of your religion is fraud and you still believe I have not been shown that um, and I, I don't think any atheist out there has shown that and so if you have things that you believe uh, completely disprove Christianity, uh, then, you know, by all means, share it with us because Paul says that if Jesus didn't really rise from the dead, then our faith is futile, we're still in our sins, and we're to be pitied above all men. So he even admits that, you know, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation point. If there is no evidence for that, if there's no reason to believe that, then we shouldn't believe it. Number three, you can't find any fault or evil in your holy book or God, even though atheists see and tell you it's there. Just because somebody tells you something doesn't mean it's true. And the, the atheist, um, they point and cherry pick out of... Uh, at specific verses or specific events, and they don't even give the whole context or understand the whole context of 
that event. I, you know, I recently, we started study through the Bible at my church, and we've been in Genesis. And so we talked about the flood, and we talked about the Tower of Babel. We talked about Sodom and Gomorrah already. And those three events are usually picked out as like these horrible, atrocious things, or even like the conquest of, you know, Jericho. Those things are picked out as like these horrible, atrocious things that if God can do that and tell his people to do that, then and I don't want to worship that God. And they don't understand the context of that, those events at all. And we talked about how those events are really stories of God's grace if you really understand the context. And so if you want to go on my other channel, Study Through the Bible, we have those lessons and those sermons and everything that go through those events. And you can find that, uh, you know, that it's really about God's grace. And, and yes, it does talk about his judgment, but, you know, when you have a context where he's given them a thousand years to repent and they're still caught up in wickedness and spreading their wickedness around, do you really want people that, that are like that to just get away with that and have no consequences at all? I, I really don't even understand where atheists are coming from with the whole problem of evil argument. Number four, science debunks all your religion's stories, yet you still believe them. They haven't. And you may not be aware of this, but most of the early scientists were Christian. And they saw the science as a discipline, as a way of understanding God's creation, knowing that they would never fully grasp it or understand it or be able to manipulate it or change it. But they, they saw it as a way of getting to know God in a deeper way. And science has all of a sudden flipped to, like, if you believe in, in, in Jesus, then somehow you are a true scientist. When every, like most of the major disciplines, and if you think that there are no Christians who are science, scientists and, and leaders in their fields, then you are sadly mistaken because there are strong Christians who are the leaders in almost every discipline of science out there. And so uh, that number four, again, wrong. Number five, you actually believe complete, utter nonsense that makes no sense and alter and warn reality in your mind to fuel your delusion. And so, uh, if you believe complete utter nonsense, I believe that, yes, you are absolutely right. But show me where I believe complete utter nonsense uh, in, in light of everything that I just said. And something that just completely is outside reality, and I, I, I'm just fueling my delusion. Just show me where I'm actually doing that instead of just saying that I'm doing it. And I, I would be willing to talk to you about it. And so that is, uh, you know, like the little lesson from our friend there. And I, I will say that um, the things that he has on that list, though, are true. If a person does find themselves believing in something that is not grounded in reality and is not grounded in evidence, it's not grounded in um, uh good reasons to place your faith in something that and they are just feeling and then they just put thoughts that they don't like on a shelf that is something called mind control that is something that's dangerous that is one of the major uh, if not the primary characteristics of a cult that i talk about on this channel now you under, have to understand that christianity is you know different talking about christianity itself Talking about the Bible itself is different than talking about someone's interpretation of the Bible or talking about a group, um, a particular group that has deviated away from Orthodox Christian doctrine and practice. So the things on that list are good qualifications for things that you, it might be signs that you're in a dangerous religious group that you should get away from as fast as possible. But I don't believe that I personally um, am caught up in that. And if you can show me otherwise, then I'm open to talking more. So uh, new likes on Facebook, Pat and Flannery, Caitlin Northcutt. And uh, so last week I talked about uh, Church Universal and Triumphant, and I mentioned that they have the 12 tenets of faith that are listed on their website. And as I started reading them, I said, I'm going to get into those because they look like maybe they're links that talk about something that explains what they're meaning. And what I found is when I went back this week, 
No, it's not. And there, there is no explanation anywhere for any of these things. Um, they might have articles, you know, on some of these ideas that give you a little bit better, better context, but they just list these things, which sound like utter gibberish to me, uh, but this is what they are. Uh, it, there are 11 of them. Okay, it, well, they say there's 12, and then they list 11. So that's interesting. I wonder if there were... 12, and then they cut. I, that's weird. Okay, foundation, head, and communicants of church, universal, and triumphant. That is a tenet of faith. I have no idea what that means. Number two, God, Christ, and the soul. Number three, ascended masters, hierarchy, the great white brotherhood. Okay, that last one is scary. I don't know what that means, but... Uh, if anyone knows what any of these things mean, please put it in the comments down below or a link or something. Uh, sacred scriptures, progressive revelation, the messengers. Number five, the path of becoming the Christ and the Buddha. Christ and the Buddha. Interesting, right? Number six, the divine mother and the Aquarian age. Number seven, baptism, violet flame, balance of karma. Number eight, the nine sacraments of the church. The nine sacraments of the church. Wow, okay. Um, number 10. Uh, number, oh, number nine. Free will, Antichrist, Armageddon. Okay, that's scary. Number 10. Sacrifice, surrender, selflessness, and service. Number 11. The law of the tithe. So that's the church universal and triumphant 12 tenets of faith uh, for those of you who've been asking about that group. And... Um, so from YouTube, uh, we go back to our other friend that we've been spending some time with, and I've been going back and forth, and he uh, takes offense to some of my beliefs and some of the things that I've said about his beliefs, and he pointed me to his channel. He says, if you want to know what I believe, then go to my channel. And interestingly enough, he has a YouTube channel, but he doesn't make videos or believe in making videos. Instead, what he's done is he's just uh, put in the comments field um, just these article type things that you would usually have like a blog for and we're just taking one of those at a time to understand what he believes and just respond to it. So this one's called How Long Before the Pre-Tribulational Rapture. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 34, also in Mark 13, 30, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Most Bible scholars agree Jesus' reference to the generation sh that shall not pass is the one that sees Israel become a nation, which happened in 1948. The length of a generation is defined in Psalm 90:10. The days of our years are three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be four score, four score years. So right off the bat, what I have to say is that I don't think he's understanding the concept of a generation. Um, a generation is not how long you live. A generation is like how long before you have another kid. You are one generation, they're the second generation. When they have kids, that's the third generation. People generally don't wait until they're 60, 70, 80 to have kids. And so um, your logic is faulty. But also, um, all that's doing is trying to find a rationale. Uh, Hal Lindsey, uh, as well as many others, ha were the ones who popularized this interpretation of what Jesus said, that, saying that the fig tree is Israel. And so when you see the fig tree bloom is what Jesus was pointing to, meaning that Israel becomes a nation, which happened in 1948. And they're actually celebrating the 70th year anniversary of that this year. And when you see that uh, come to pass, then a generation, that generation will no longer that they will not pass away. I recently preached when we were going through the end of the Gospels um, on this topic, and so you can head over to my study through the Bible, actually on this channel, it's still on this channel too, um, and you can look and see my, my sermons on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 24 and how I, I look at that because a lot of preterist understanding is like Jesus was saying, that generation in which he lived would not pass away. And then there's the Hal Lindsey interpretation that this guy holds to, uh, which would still be wrong because in 1988, 40 years is reasonable to say for a generation, even biblically. 
And uh, so in 1988, that would have made that a faulty interpretation if that was the correct one. But I, I believe that Jesus was saying that, you know, when you see the signs of the sun, moon, and stars. So in other words, the events of Revelation, once they start to unfold, a, a generation is not going to pass away before the, everything's wrapped up. And so uh, people differ on when they believe the events in Revelation uh, took place or are going to take place. And so I believe that they are future and so I would disagree with this interpretation. So from 70 to 80 years, which leaves a 10-year window of possibility when we add 1948 plus 70 equals 2018. But Jesus said, till all these things be fulfilled, which includes the second coming. And, and that's exactly what I was just saying. Subtracting seven years for the time of judgment, we get 2011. Clearly, we have passed that date, so we are already within the 10-year window. So he's saying we are in the tribulation. I, I don't see any signs that we actually are. I mean, you're just taking a mathematical formula, which I don't even agree with your terms of that formula, and you're doing everything that Harold Camping and, um, uh, you know, William Miller, and all of those who have gone before you have done. And you are setting yourself up to be a false prophet that everyone can point to and say, look, he was wrong. And I guarantee you, we're in 2018 now. And so I don't know if you wrote that. You obviously wrote it after 2011, but I think you wrote it before this year. And so, you know, okay, so fine. Let's give you 10 more years before we all point at you and call you a false prophet because I guarantee you you're wrong, okay? So now add 1948 plus 80 equals 2028, subtract 7 equals 2021. So in 2021, three more years actually, we get to, uh, we get to actually uh, know whether you're a false prophet or not which I already think you are. I think your interpretations are, are way off. Anyway, using these numbers, it is my simple conclusion the rapture of the church will occur before the end of 2021. That's less than four years. There is no way the world will continue on as it's going for that long. So I think my conclusion is a pretty safe bet. Maranatha, baby. Okay. All right. So that, uh, that was um, some thoughts you know, from our friend there. Now, let's go ahead and jump in to uh, Matt Smith and uh, Seven Day Adventist questions. And um, he uh, handed me a whole packet of stuff. He got his uh, Seven Day Adventist seminar he attended. And he said, hey, look through this. You know, I was concerned by some of the things you said about that um, group. And so, but they seem to be backing up everything they said with the Bible. And so as I've been reading through their different articles and what they believe about, you know, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, everything, um, I read this one on salvation this week. And they're being very careful in these articles to, and how they word things. And so here's the only thing that I found in this article. The experience of salvation, it says, we have the assurance that as long as we choose to remain in him, he will sustain us with his hand and never will he let us go. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand, John 10, 29. And so uh, they, they are not alone in this idea, in this interpretation of this. Um, and I've always had a problem with this. The people that say that they they understand nobody nobody else can snatch you out of the Father's hand, but you can choose to go out of his hand. But my question is, are you a somebody? Because if you are a somebody, then you then when Jesus says nobody, that applies to all somebodies, and that would include you. Nobody can snatch them out of my hand. And that means that you can't snatch yourself out of his hand. And I, I would think that if you just take this a little bit further, uh, the way that people talk about, you know, possibility of losing your salvation really uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because they would say, well, salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. Now, the seven-day Adventists, I don't believe, would teach that. I believe that they believe in a very real way that Jesus made it 
possible for you to be saved. But he did not purchase your salvation or pay for your sins. You ensure by your works and the way you live and the law you follow whether or not you're going to uh, be saved. And that's uh, evidenced by the whole investigative judgment um, doctrine that they, Ellen White taught. And um, that is the idea that Jesus is going through the records of heaven to figure out who's worthy, who's worthy to enter into the kingdom of God, into, into heaven. So, but if you think about it, they, they portray this idea of losing your salvation as just like people, one day they wake up and they decide, just completely separate and isolated as an event, I don't believe in God anymore. I don't want to follow Jesus anymore. And then they just start openly talking bad about, you know, God. And that doesn't make any sense. Nobody just who is a follower of Jesus Christ wakes up one day and says, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. There has to be something that somebody did, something that happened to them, or something that they did that caused that progression over time, over a long period of time, to you know where they are, you know, backsliding into their sin. They are turning, you know, towards you know sources that are making them question things that they're being taught in church or taught in the Bible, okay? And then they, <clears throat> they cumulatively reach a point where they are so caught up in sin or they are so caught up in doubt in which they start wandering away. And then eventually they reach a point where they say, you know what, this isn't a part of me and this isn't who I am anymore. Now, there's no way to say that there weren't other people that were associated with that. And there's no way to say that it, was, it wasn't your sin that actually caused you to lose your salvation. It wasn't your works that caused you to lose your salvation. But if salvation is by grace through faith, then how can one lose their salvation through works or through sin? That doesn't make any sense to me. If you uh, have another way of looking at that, please put it in the comments down below and let's further the conversation. But to me, that's just one of those, th those things that the, one of the biggest things, apart from like the scapegoat doctrine, apart from the investigative judgment, and, and apart from some of the other you know, weird or eccentric teachings of Ellen White or her character in general, uh, I would say that the biggest divide between Seventh-day Adventist and Christianity is salvation by works. Uh, and that's true of a number of groups, even acknowledged denominations within the Christian church. And um, I would just say to those of you who believe that you can lose your salvation, I would just ask you, how do you reconcile that idea with salvation by grace through faith? And so if one of you could just help me, and maybe I would even have you on the channel have a conversation about it, uh, to how do you reconcile that idea that uh, we are saved by grace through faith and not by works, with the idea of being able to lose your salvation. So that is uh, on the idea of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now, another one from YouTube this last week. Uh, your research is nothing compared to committing 10 years of your life to it. And this is talking about the Great Commission churches. So this person spent 10 years of their life in the Great Commission churches, and they say, you are not an expert. Everything you said is incredibly superficial. Go visit one, spend time with them. Then you will know the truth. And what you need to understand is all of the information that I have about the Great Commission churches comes from people who were in the Great Commission churches. I, I don't have personal experience with the Great Commission churches. But I, it was a student in my class on the Colts at Bethel Seminary who was a part of it and started talking to me about all of these things as I was writing my book, which my book, by the way, Sharing Jesus with the Colts, available on Amazon as paperback or Kindle. Uh, but she is the reason why 
that chapter got into my book because as she started talking about it, it drove me to investigate further into this group and to find out um, if the things that she was saying were being said by others. And I found this whole network of people who have come out of the church and they were saying exactly the same things, which I document pretty well in my book. And um, so, yes, your experience in the church was positive, and you didn't experience the mind control practices. You didn't experience any of these things. And so, praise God. And not everybody who is in these groups is going to experience it the same way or experience the same things. They are individual churches. And by the way, um, I was contacted by the leader or the, the, the PR guy, at least, uh, from this group. And I took certain things that he said in my initial draft of the book. Um, I took them out or changed the way that I said them because I didn't have the same kind of documentation on those things as I did on others. And so when I am wrong, I am willing to admit that I am wrong. I am willing to change my opinion. I am willing to uh, change my views. And I'm even willing to state it publicly. And so if there is something in particular that you have evidence that I said was false, then please bring it to my attention and I will, um, I will make record of it. Okay? So going on, another one on YouTube. Uh, hi, brother. Please give what you think of this one. And uh, this was somebody who, the person who had um, brought that sadhu, um, Salvaraj, uh, the, the false prophet, to my attention, and I did a video. My last Q&A was kind of focusing on him, and or two uh, ago, anyway, um, and shows now she brings another message to my attention. I have it on my watch with list on YouTube. I started watching it, and it was a cat cur, by the way, and I started watching it and realized I need to do a completely separate, just reaction real time as I'm watching it video on that message and then maybe go back through and edit you know real long dead spaces or something like that but I got three minutes in and she was already talking about you know angels being outside the church and Jesus being on stage behind her and then Jesus starts just talking through her so her message she claims was actually Jesus speaking through her reminds me of um, Jesus calling that book and um if you're not familiar with that, Sarah Young, uh, the, the recent edition, she's just completely taken out the whole uh, process by the, through which she actually went through, uh, where she actually believes she was channeling Jesus, and that those words are actually scripture that is being spoken through by Jesus through her in that book, and that you can do the exact same thing. And so if you... Uh, you or your church has been uh, looking at Jesus Calling or studying Jesus Calling. I don't even know how you study that book. But anyway, lots of New Age influence, lots of uh, occultic stuff uh, that's coming through. And just that whole concept of Jesus actually speaking through her and her words being the same as divine scripture. Dangerous, dangerous stuff. So um, Kat Kerr and her message and her approach seems like she takes the same kind of thing. But watch for that video, like I said, haven't had a lot of time, but it's going to be coming up soon, and that's going to be a it's going to be a wild one. Anyway, um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. Again, you went on to say love your programs, and so does my friends. Thank you, and keep up the good work. Thank you for sharing the channel with your friends. So now we go to Facebook. And uh, somebody says, I don't belong to Mormon's church because Mormon didn't have a church. I belong to the church of Jesus Christ, the church that our Lord and Savior Jesus himself established when he lived on the earth. And I know that that is what Mormons believe. I, I know. And I, I recently heard that the, the current prophet, um, which my, the name is blanking on me right now. But anyway that he is trying to establish himself as a prophet. So he has claimed recently that by personal revelation, he received that they are no longer to call themselves Mormon or LDS. 
that they are the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So they're trying to disassociate themselves from the term Mormon or even the shortcut version because they are trying to emphasize the whole Jesus Christ part of it and that they are the church that Jesus has established. So I understand that you believe this and I understand where you're coming from, but my question is if you just had the Bible— and I know that you believe that the Bible has not been translated correctly, more properly transmitted correctly, and that the Book of Mormon is the most accurate book on the face of the earth. I know you believe that. But if you just had the Bible, could you show me why you believe certain things and why you practice certain things and why you believe that your church is the one true church that Jesus founded. Um, and I would love to have a conversation with you and just talk about what Jesus taught and um, just have an intelligent conversation on that. So, you know, reach out to me, keep the conversation going, and I would love to do that with you. Okay. A next question from Facebook. Are you a cessationist? No, I am not. I believe very much that the spiritual gifts are for today. I believe I was personally healed of leukemia when I was 14 years old. And I, I believe that God can and, and does heal people. He does, you know, manifest himself through miracles, speaking in tongues, all that kind of stuff. However, I don't believe that those are spiritual gifts. I believe Romans 12 uses the language of spiritual gift, grace gifts, more specifically in the Greek. And those gifts, Paul says the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. Those are things that are given by the Spirit and they stay with you. Like I believe I have the gift of teaching, okay? And that's something that became obvious and it was just something that was in there. God gave it to me. It's been there ever since and I love doing it. I have a passion for doing it and I've been commended by others uh, for that. So, uh, you know... That I believe that there's seven, maybe eight things that are listed there, uh, but I believe every Christian can find themselves in one of those things, if you understand those terms and properly what they mean. 1 Corinthians 12, Paul uses the language of manifestation, which is different. A manifestation is something that God can choose to do through whoever he wants, whenever he wants, as often as he wants, but it's something that comes upon you and he does through you and then it goes. So those who claim that they have a gift of healing and that like they can schedule healing services and things of that nature, I don't think that that is what the intention or what the scriptures actually say about that. So no, I am not a cessationist, but I do believe that a lot of Pentecostals and their interpretation of those things are incorrect, and I believe a lot of their practice of those things, and especially the things that they do that are outside and are not even mentioned, don't, aren't discussed, and I have connections, some of them, with occultic practices. Yes, I believe those are way out of bounds, and so no, I'm not a cessationist. Uh, Google, okay, and we already talked about this one. So that is the questions for this week. So if you have a question or an insight um, comment, then please put that down below. I'll be taking some of those for next week's Q&A. And like I said, I already have a backlog of stuff that I need to get through. Um, so it may be a little bit before I get to your question, but hang in there, put it down below. Let's get the conversation going, whether you agree with me, don't agree with me. Um, let's keep the conversations going. And if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. Give this a thumbs up if you like the content for today. Share this with others who want, uh, who are interested in cults and how to share the gospel with them. And until next time, may God's grace be with you.